Good evening, everybody. Our top stories, America's schools under assault. Radical leftists in Atlanta schools throwing the Pledge of Allegiance out in favor of a pledge to global society. While a radical Islamist with ties to the 1993 World Trade Center bombing has been caught allegedly building a child army of school shooters. Also tonight, the Dems and the national left-wing media refusing to give up on preposterous notions of a blue wave. If Ohio's 12th district is any indication, a blue wave may be coming in November. In normal times, this seat would be a lock for Republicans. These, of course, are not normal times. And this blue wave is starting to look bigger and bigger. Could tonight be the beginning of a blue wave? <laughs> Rhinos and the Republican establishment also refusing to give President Trump any credit for the 18 candidates that he's endorsed who've already won this year. And the midterms haven't begun. We'll hear from two of those candidates winning races after being endorsed by President Trump. Kansas gubernatorial hopeful Chris Kobach joins us tonight. And Michigan congressional candidate Lena Epstein. Plus tonight, President Trump's Space Force blasting off. Look at those logos. Vice President Pence outlining the mission today at the Pentagon. As President Trump has said in his words, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space. And we'll tell you about a new Russian threat that makes the president's call for the U.S. military in space all the more urgent. Our top story, new efforts being made to expose the concerted effort among Dems in the deep state to destroy President Donald Trump before, during, and after the 2016 presidential election. Senate Judiciary Chairman Charles Grassley now demanding the videotape deposition of Christopher Steele, the British spy, author of the discredited Trump dossier. Grassley asking for the deposition, uh, which is in the possession of a Russian uh, oligarch uh, who is suing BuzzFeed for printing that dossier and allegedly defaming him and his companies. The deposition could finally shed light on events that led to the appointment of the special counsel to investigate the president. Steele has yet to tell Congress details about who he was working for and when that it was Fusion GPS that hired Steele, paid for by the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee. And oh yes, there's no investigation into all of that. Also today, Judicial Watch filing a lawsuit seeking all communications from the offices of the Deputy Attorney General related to the Justice Department's Bruce Orr, his wife Nellie Orr, who worked for Fusion, and Christopher Steele. Bruce Orr, now in the crosshairs of congressional inquiries, newly released emails and memos show Orr continued to receive information from Steele in 2017 after the FBI terminated its relationship with Steele for leaking to the media or acting as a conduit between the Department of Justice, Steele, and Fusion GPS. Joining me now, Judicial Watch President Tom Fenton. Tom, great to have you here. Hello. Let's start with uh, now the reemergence of Orr as a centerpiece, if you will, uh, in the, the conspiracy, the corrupt conspiracy in the Department of Justice to, to absolutely subvert the presidency of President Trump. Well, you know, we had the documents that we just uncovered uh, earlier this week showing that the FBI had cut off uh, Steele, supposedly, in November of 2016. Well, that was no impediment to or continuing to work with Steele. And, the, and, and as corruptly, the FBI taking still information from Steele through or while pretending that they were cutting him off and not telling the FISA courts any of this. You have the corrupt relationship Orr had with Fusion GPS as a result of the conflict, uh, as a result of his wife working there. And then, of course, you had the conflict with uh, the conflict of interest that was potentially criminal with Strzok and company, who were out to get Trump for political purposes. I don't understand why this Mueller operation is allowed to continue 
uh, given the, the it's built on sand and it's yeah. corruption. I, I don't sand. think there's any I, I, question I, I, in the no minds doubt of the that's public. That's got to be stopped. Yeah, Tom, I, I don't think there's any question in, in the minds of most uh, in the public, uh, certainly. Uh, about the the conflicts that Mueller represents in being named special counsel in accepting the post that Rosenstein uh, uh, swept aside as he named Mueller and the continued conduct of the special counsel, uh, which is, as the president has at, uh, at, at the outset said, it is a witch hunt. There's been no evidence. We have five congressional committees that have produced no evidence of any collusion. Uh, this is, uh, it, it is, as the president said, it's an illegal sham. And the, the Republican leadership, whether on Capitol Hill and leading the Senate, leading the House, uh, they are not doing a thing to support this president. And that is beyond comprehension. You know, the, pre the, the, the collusion investigation is over. And the media doesn't want to report it, but the special counsel himself has issued a series of indictments against Russians and others uh, about collusion issues. There was no collusion with any Americans, knowingly, with the Russians related to anything about the campaign. So what else is there to investigate in terms of collusion? So I mean, who this will is end it? Who will stop it? How does it end? Because it is a travesty. I think the president needs to take executive or legal steps to stop it at this point because the Justice Department isn't going to do it. I mean, look at this ridiculous Manafort prosecution that's going on out of the special counsel's office. We don't need a special counsel to do that. Right. The fact that they're letting the special counsel uh, target Manafort over the cost of his suits and mortgage fraud and bank fraud and all of that. Uh, when they were hired to investigate Russia collusion, shows uh, the leadership there is unwilling to take steps to control Mueller and constrain him, in a, even in a reasonable way, to focus on what he was hired to do. Well, the, the judge in that case has had a number of opportunities to stop the, uh, the trial, uh, to recognize that uh, it was a contrivance, the prosecution by the special counsel, from dead files in the Department of Justice, which had already uh, made decisions not to, not to prosecute Manafort. Uh, so it is remarkable in that regard. It has nothing to do with the president nor the campaign uh, that Manafort led for several months in the summer of 2016. Nonetheless, this is a judiciary that is showing itself to be every bit as corrupt as the leadership of the Department of Justice. We are watching partisan decisions being taken by uh, judges, and it depends on who appointed them, uh, as to what one can expect from them in the courtroom and in their decisions and in their rulings. It's a travesty, but the, the question remains. You and I both know, and I think most Americans know, that the decision by the president, if he were to intervene individually and personally, uh, whether it would be the firing of Rosenstein, if it would be the firing uh, of the attorney general or, or Bob Mueller, uh, that's a highly politically charged decision, and he doesn't have a party united behind him to do so because the rhinos, like Ryan in particular and McConnell, uh, and their like that sit in either the Senate or the House, will not support this president who is leading this party as uh, it has not been led in modern times. You know, he may not have the support of uh, some Republicans in the Congress, but he has the support of the American people. I don't think there's much interest in seeing this investigation continue. Uh, the, there's, the argument, I think, has taken hold with a good portion of the electorate, if not the majority, that this is a politicized investigation uh, that needs to end. And uh, he'll look, the media goes crazy no matter whatever the president does. He should do the right thing here. The media will go crazy for a minute and a half and then move on yeah. to something else. Yeah, I think that the, I, I would disagree with you on the latter part of your uh, conjecture. And that is the national left-wing media uh, is absolutely intent uh, on subversion uh, of this president. They le watch, watch the CNN broadcast, watch NBC, watch the Washington Post front oh, sure. page. There's six to eight stories a day that are decidedly and pointedly negative about the Trump administration and personally attacking uh, the President of the United States. These are not accidents. That kind of vitriol and hatred uh, in uh, support of an ideolog ideological purpose will not abate easily. 
uh, in my opinion. Tom, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Tom Fenton of Judicial man. Watch, which has been Thank doing you. remarkable work in revealing what we do know about the witch hunt that, uh, that Bob Mueller has been leading, um, well, for 48 hours after interviewing for the director of the FBI for President Trump and being rejected. Up next... An Atlanta charter school stops requiring students to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll tell you about their plans for a new pledge. It's uh, somewhat global. We'll be right back with that and much more next. Stay with us. A Georgia school has stopped requiring its students to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Students at the kindergarten through fifth grade Atlanta Neighborhood Charter School no longer recite the pledge at their all-school morning meeting. The school claiming that many of their students, remember, kindergartners, first grade, second, third, fourth, and fifth, no longer want to participate, they say. Students who do want to honor our flag and our country can do so, they say, in their own classrooms at another time. To replace the pledge, the school, you're going to love this, wants to draft a pledge of its own, uh, created by the students. The school's president said of these young people, teachers in the K-5 leadership team will be working with students to create a school pledge that we can say together at morning meeting. This pledge will focus on students' civic responsibility to their school, family, community, country, and our global society. Wow. Wouldn't a simple Pledge of Allegiance to the country that makes all of them possible be more appropriate? And a New Mexico man has been arrested because he was allegedly training children to be terrorists at the extremist Muslim compound he created in New Mexico, authorities say. The suspect is the son of the New York City imam who testified as a character witness in the trial following the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Police raided the compound. They found 11 children living in abject squalor. They also found a rifle, four loaded pistols. The prosecutors say he was training kids to carry out school shootings. Well, Lena Epstein rode the Trump train all the way to victory in this week's Republican primary in Michigan's 11th congressional district. President Trump recognized her achievement in a tweet. He said this, Congratulations to Lena Epstein of Michigan, on a job well done. Also, thanks for your great support. Lena joins us now as the newly elected Republican nominee for Congress from the 11th District. Congratulations first, Lena, on your uh, your victory. Uh, a, a remarkable. Uh, what? Let me ask you this. Now, as yes. you approach the uh, general election, uh, what divides you from, differentiates you uh, from your Democratic opponent? Absolutely. I am a job creator, somebody who has spent her life in the private sector, and I'm very, very honored to be the Republican nominee in Michigan's 11th Congressional District race. It will be my responsibility to reach out to Democrats and to independents to let everybody in Southeast Michigan know that there is a home for them in this campaign. It's an incredibly exciting time to be an American in this country. I was very humbled by President Trump's endorsement and his tweet. And most importantly, I will be focused on the citizens of Southeast Michigan who want very, very simple but important things. They want lower taxes, mm -hmm. less regulation. They're, they're enjoying the economic benefits that have come from a Trump presidency. People want to know that they'll have a doctor to take their child to when their child is sick and if they'll be able to afford the copay. It will be my focus over these next 90 days leading into November 6th to represent all people in Southeast Michigan. And I, like, I, I come from a family of Democrats and Republicans mm -hmm. and independents. You must have, had a, you must have had a good everybody. time in your family with uh, Democrats and Republicans, particularly over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, you've resolved it in favor of the Trump uh, agenda. Uh, what you're yes, describing sir. is the Trump agenda and the Trump achievements. Uh, yes, of the sir. first uh, 20 months in office. It's remarkable. Uh, Michigan, uh, also, uh, your race, uh, we were looking at the highest, we are looking at the highest turnout for a primary election uh, yes. in 20 years. There's yes. a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of interest, uh, intensity, as the savants uh, in, in politics say. 
What do you think is driving that? I've said this many times before in the weeks leading up to Tuesday and, and of course all week that this 2018 midterm election, the battleground will be Michigan's 11th congressional district. It will be one of the top 10 most highly contested races, but I am ready for the general election fight of a lifetime. It will be my goal to represent all citizens in Southeast Michigan, Republicans, independents and Democrats alike, mm. I meet with voters every day and the message is loud and clear that people want a congresswoman like me to put the citizens of Southeast Michigan first. We are thriving in our economy. We are thrilled that this, this, uh, this conversation between now and November 6 will truly be about what the citizens want the most. Citizens want security. They want economic opportunities, and they want freedom for them and their families. That is what I'll be fighting for going into November and beyond. The president's tariffs, the president's yes. position on immigration, yes. border security, and the sovereignty of the nation. Uh, do you believe that the people of both the 11th District and the state of Michigan, uh, which, by the way, uh, the Attorney General Bill Shewitt, uh, also running for the Senate, uh, the Republican nominee now, uh, 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 James, uh, 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 James, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on his first name. Uh, I mean, that's remarkable, the number of candidates that the president has nominated who've won. Uh, are Absolutely. You, are you consonant, uh, are they consonant with the president on all of those issues? I can't speak about any other candidate but myself, and I stand with President Trump on the critical focus and need and desire to secure our border. I've said this many times before, that right now we essentially have an open border between the United States and Mexico. We have illicit firearms, illegal drugs, gangs, human beings being trafficked between our two nations, and only God knows what is really happening and what's transpiring between those two borders. We must build the wall. We must put American security first. A country without borders, Lou, does not exist. And I think that the American dream and this beautiful, beautiful country that we have is worth fighting for. And I look forward to joining President Trump and members in Congress to advance the America First agenda. And John James and Bill Shewitt, who we also endorsed. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, that you have uh, contributed mightily to the interest and uh, to the energy of the campaign. Congratulations on your uh, winning the nomination and uh, good luck come November. We appreciate Thank it. you. And I would like everyone to know that there is a home for Republicans, independents, and Democrats in the Lena for Congress, Michigan's 11th Congressional District race. I think that's a wonderful message delivered three times in the course of this conversation. We take your point. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Best. Vice President Pence today launching America's plan to bring its military might to outer space. The vice president saying a space force is expected to be in place by 2020. And he made the case that Americans must prepare for space threats from the countries, Russia, China, North Korea, and others. The Space Force will also uh, get our astronauts off Russian spacecraft, we're told. By the way, since 2006, NASA will have spent more than $3 billion for seats on Soyuz rockets. 3% of NASA's entire budget diverted to Russia, but for a good reason. Because sadly, sadly, that's the only way we could get American astronauts into space. Be sure to vote in our poll. Do you think every school receiving taxpayer money should demand students honor America and recite the Pledge of Allegiance? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Follow me on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. Up next, Jim Acosta. Well, he isn't happy. He isn't happy so often, but he's not happy about how the White House treats him. And that's not really new either, but it is news this time. We're all uh, fed up with, uh, with the treatment that we're receiving, and I'm not the only one uh, to, to speak out about this. No, he certainly isn't. We'll take that up and more with Ed Rollins. Stay with us a lot, a lot more straight ahead. Stay with us. Well, here's a story about CNN and one of its uh, bright lights, uh, they say, Jim Acosta, who recently walked out on a White House press briefing and told reporters to chant, we are not the enemy of the people. 
uh, it, it, he's, it, it's just hard to believe that, you know, it's like saying you're not a crook. If you have to say you're not a crook, usually it means you're a crook. Now he says he doesn't want to be the story. Poor Jim. Poor, poor Jim. Be the story. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's not why I'm out there. Um, you know, I get accused of that from time to time. And, and my attitude is, listen, I'm, I'm allowed to care about this country just as much as anybody else. Let me put my hand over my heart as he talks about our country because he was so sincere there. Uh, Tom Strategist, Great America PAC uh, chair, former Reagan political director, Fox News political analyst, Ed Rollins. I, is, are those tears I see in your eye as Acosta <laughs> talked about caring about the country? Uh, he should be grateful that I'm not the White House communications director. He'd be doing all of his stories from outside the, 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 the Iron Gates. Uh, you know, these guys do not have a right to be there. They have a right to cover the president, cover the government, but they don't have a right to be in the press room. They don't have a right to insult people. It's a very confined space. Uh, CNN has an opportunity to put somebody in there who basically can do the job, and he certainly isn't. And, and he says, I don't want to be the story, but yet he's sitting down doing an interview right there. That story. And who was he with. talking to? Uh, in, in late night comedians, right. and, you know, right. uh, a, a great venue. Uh, you know, I've talked to them, too. I'm not suggesting that no, that no, in but, any way invalidates his uh, august credentials uh, to be at the White House press uh, and, and the White House press corps. Uh, but I do think that his conduct uh, has reached a level. Where I, I don't understand why Sarah Sanders puts up with him. I don't understand why anybody puts up with him. Just dismiss him, move him on, and let CNN decide whether they want to send somebody to cover the president. Well, that's that's what I would certainly do if I was there, but I'm not. And obviously, I've worked for a couple of presidents that might have thrown him out. Richard Nixon for one. <laughs> but, uh, well, Ronald Reagan for Ronald one. Reagan too. Uh, Ronald, you know, Ronald, Ronald Reagan didn't get pushed. Ronald Reagan didn't get pushed around by the press. Ronald Reagan basically, you know, yeah. as you recall, because you were old. Often cover him. Uh, yeah, he demanded respect. Absolutely. And, uh, and the president deserves respect. Any absolutely. president deserves I mean, respect. But I love the idea that he cares, he's allowed to care about the country. Well, my goodness. Uh, he's talking about the president of the United States. I, and his, behavior, I mean, his behavior's been insulting. I mean, the bottom line, he wants, he wants to report on the White House, he can do that, but uh, he doesn't have to. That, that, the, the best thing he can do He's for just the country, an annoying he's, son he's, of a gun. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's so. a very annoying son of a gun. And, I just want to compliment the White House for putting up with that nonsense uh, and his sheer, uh, well, whatever you want to call what he is. Uh, let, let's turn to the, the, the blue wave. Suddenly the left-wing media, CNN amongst them, uh, just delighting in uh, how close the race was in the 12th district uh, in Kansas. Uh, and they're just bragging about uh, how close this is and how it it augurs for a blue wave uh, in November. Your thoughts? My thoughts are, from 50 years of doing campaigns, is you don't win until, unless you get the most votes. Coming in a close second doesn't mean much. Uh, unless you're a you Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, this, you know, for, the, for a year now we've been talking about they're coming closer, they're getting more uh, closer to a victory. Well, you got to get the victory. And, and the reality is there's 89 days to go between now and the convention. I, I mean, down the, in the election day. Uh, and my sense is that the voters uh, in Ohio and other places uh, uh, had had an opportunity to go out and make their choice, and they did. Seventeen hundred votes is plenty of votes to get you get you there. And and uh, and my sense is this this gentleman will win again, uh, uh, and it went big. Uh, the numbers don't hold up for. Talk about Balderson in the right in the trial. Uh, there's no indication anymore that there's going to be a wave. There, the reality is that those numbers have shrunk closer and closer. The Wall Street Journal editorial page talking about the, you know things aren't as rosy as the president suggests. Uh, in, in point of fact, the man has uh, called 18 races with his endorsements. And nobody is running even close to it, well, except you, because recently you have been, into, if he endorses, you call the race for it. I, I try and do it before he endorses, but that's okay. No, no, I, but I'm talking uh, about in the last, the, yes, this yes. last five. Uh, the, 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 the reality is he's created, uh, as I said the other night, there's an economy that's strong. His numbers are strong. You, as a Republican candidate, you can't ask for anything more. The, the only vulnerability we have is we have all these incumbents and aren't running for re-election, and we're going to lose a couple of seats just simply because they're vacant and they're new people. But there's no reason for us to lose this majority. We have to just go out and campaign and campaign aggressively, and you've got 89 days to do it. Yeah. Bill Shewitt in Michigan and John James, and I want to apologize to him for blanking on his first name. Two simple <laughs> names, and I messed up 50% of them. 
Uh, they, along with Lena Epstein, I mean, those are exciting candidates. Well, I, I think things have to look pretty good Bill, uh, Bill in has, Michigan. Bill has been around a long time. I've known him when he was a congressman. He's a first-class guy. Uh, uh, James is a fascinating story, a guy full of... Graduated from West Point, flew helicopters, uh, uh, an African-American in Michigan, can attract voters that not traditional white Republican are going to get, and I think he's got a real shot of winning this thing. Well, uh, I, it looks to me like all three should, uh, but then I... You're the you're the you're the prognosticator. I'm oh, I, I, a, a I don't, humble I, servant. It, there's 89 more days to go. A lot's going to happen in 89 days. You uh, betcha. But, but the momentum. I, is, I like momentum it when we start side. when we go to the early days discussion <laughs> in politics. It's <laughs> always early days until it's not, and suddenly it's election night. Ed, thanks for being my pleasure. Appreciate it, Ed Rollins, a border patrol agent. Tonight is recovering after being attacked by six illegal immigrants. One of the suspects was arrested. The other five suspects. Uh, eluded capture and returned to Mexico. Meanwhile, in Minnesota and Nebraska, a 15-month-long investigation led Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents to arrest 133 illegal immigrant workers, many of whom were using fraudulent identification belonging to U.S. citizens. That's the same ICE, by the way, that the radical Dems want to abolish. Up next, Congressman Devin Nunes says Republicans need to protect this president from impeachment. And the national left-wing media goes berserk. Republicans are the only one campaigning on impeachment. They're saying the situation is so bad that you have to elect Republicans to protect him, and I will use my role as chairman to protect him. If that's the position of the party, um, you know, do, is the president more guilty than... I mean, that seems to me a tacit admission of guilt. You followed that, right? <laughs> I didn't. Where was the outrage when radical Dems campaigned, and still campaign, promising to impeach President Trump? I, I, I guess they just overlooked that. We will correct that for them here next. Stay with us. We'll be right back. In newly released tapes from a recent fundraiser, Congressman Devin Nunes, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, is heard saying that Republicans need to retain control of the House in order to protect President Trump from impeachment were the Democrats to win. It's something radical Dems have been talking about and swearing they will carry out all along. They dare me to say impeach him. Today I say impeach 45. I am currently crafting, drafting, if you will, uh, articles of impeachment. As a body, we must take action to relieve the president of his duties. Announcing that we are introducing articles of impeachment to remove President Trump from office. Ignorance after ignorance, and after ignoring those calls for impeachment from the last, the, the left, the national left-wing media was so outraged over Chairman Nunes saying it was shameful that he would try to shield the president. Oh, that's terrible that Republicans would want to protect this president. Uh, in the minds, at least, of the uh, national left-wing media. Uh, the fact is, Devin Nunes was absolutely correct, and the left, as usual, well, far, far gone. Uh, joining me now, Eric Eggers. He's research director at the Government Accountability Institute. He's author of the newly released book, Fraud, How the Left Plans to Steal the Next Election. Uh, Eric, it's good to have you with us. And voter fraud, we hear the left uh, continue to dismiss the very idea, saying it's the numbers are too small. It's it's not a matter that you should that we should worry our little heads about. You found quite a, a different result. That's right, Lou, and it's great to be here at the Government Accountability Institute. We decided because we're tired of hearing talk about this so-called myth of voter fraud. We want to see what the actual evidence was. So we did an unprecedented look at the national level using all the publicly available voter rolls we could gather, and we hired a data expert and contracted with a commercial database. And what we found was stunning. We found in the state of Florida what appeared to be over 2,100 examples of double voting. That means that 2,100 Floridians cast one ballot in 2016 and then cast a second ballot in a different state. And as I'm sure you and your viewers remember, that's nearly four times the margin of victory in the 2000 presidential election. So this idea that voter fraud doesn't occur on a scale to sway significant elections is clearly just not true. Well, I, I remember clearly, but uh, much of the audience is too young to remember, Eric, I'm sure. 
Uh, but everybody's aware of one thing. When the Supreme Court starts citing statistics uh, that say that the potential for voter fraud is immense, uh, that is something that we all can focus on clearly and unequivocally, and the number of double uh, state uh, registrations to vote. Uh, the number of registered voters outnumbering those who would be eligible to vote because of their age, I, I mean, it's striking, and it is deeply concerning. It absolutely is, Lou. The Supreme Court cited statistics, as you noted, that says there's nearly 3 million voter registrations in this country of people who are registered to vote in more than one state. And even the president's own, President Obama's own Commission on Election Administration in 2013 noted that 16 million Voter registrations are significantly inaccurate or flawed. In some states, it's up to 15% or 1 in 7. And you talk about the issues of um, nationwide irregularity. There's 248 counties in this nation that have more registered voters than legal residents of voting age. So clearly there's a problem, and this idea that there aren't organized efforts uh, paid for by George Soros to go out and manipulate those exploitations, that's just inconsistent with what I found in my book. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and the, the fact is that Soros is spending tens of millions of dollars uh, to pursue an election system uh, that would be the envy of the, uh, the KGB or the SRU. Uh, they, if they're trying to meddle, uh, we have enough people colluding with the Russians in that effort, uh, certainly uh, inspired by George Soros, uh, his money, and the organizations that he is funding. Yeah, you hear a lot about this idea of Russian collusion. In fact, when I told people I was writing a book on voter fraud, they said, oh, so it's going to be about the Russians, right? And look, we should clearly be concerned about any threat to election security. But I think it's silly to assume that somehow Russians are less concerned about manipulating American political outcomes than the Democrats. Yeah, I do think, by the way, that we should not only be concerned about it, we should be safeguarding the integrity of these elections. Uh, there should be uh, Republicans uh, and Democrats at every polling uh, uh, both in the country, uh, polling place in the country, to assure the integrity. Uh, but uh, you and I both know that's not going to be sufficient. And these, uh, these two parties had better be certain this time that they're doing everything they can. Your book will help in that effort. Eric, we thank you for being with us. Come back soon. We'll continue to, uh, to watch very carefully the, uh, the issues surrounding the integrity of this election. Very important. Thank you very much, Eric Eggers. Breaking news tonight, one of the former Ohio State wrestling coaches who accused Congressman Jim Jordan of knowing about a sexual assault by the team doctor has now changed his statement. In that new statement, Mark Coleman says he never said that Jordan knew about the abuse more than two decades ago. Coleman has said before he wants to cooperate with the investigation. Up next, rhinos like Congressman Carlos Carballo continue to worry that a narrow win in Ohio spells doom for the party. When will they realize that a win is a win? We take that up here next. Stay with us. Establishment rhinos continue to ignore President Trump's successful record of achievement and endorsements, and many of them are crying over Tuesday's close race in Ohio. Crocodile tears, one would say. Republican uh, Florida Congressman Carlos Curbelo claiming, quote, every white suburban district in the country will be a swing district in November. That's the takeaway. And Republican pollster Frank Luntz saying of the party, quote, this is political malpractice. You can't find me a time in modern times when the economy was this strong and the governing party was headed toward a potential political disaster like this. There is absolutely nothing disastrous about the president's endorsement record. There is absolutely nothing in remotely disastrous about his governance and his unprecedented achievements uh, in all areas of policy. Uh, what in the world those two people are thinking about and what party they're thinking about is beyond me. Joining me now, Chris Kobach, Kansas Secretary of State, Kansas Republican gubernatorial candidate, Kobach currently leads the current governor, Jeff Collier, in the Republican primary for the Republican nomination for governor, leading by 91 points. We're told that there are more than 10,000 provisional ballots yet to count. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you here, uh, Chris Kobach, and what a race uh, 
I mean, what you have done against a uh, in, incumbent governor uh, is remarkable. Uh, there will be people lining up to be Secretary of State uh, now that you've uh, done so well. Where, where do you stand in the race? What do you? What is your understanding of your uh, chances with those remaining? And, and if you would, give us your estimate of the number of provisional uh, votes uh, still to, to count. Sure. Thanks, Lou. Um, yeah, so basically at this stage, uh, there are a few more uh, points in the process where the, the ballot totals will be updated. Uh, on Friday, tomorrow, there will, that's the day under Kansas law where any ballot that was uh, postmarked, a mail-in ballot, postmarked by Election Day and received by the counties up, up till Friday, all of those will be added to the tally. So that may be a few hundred or so uh, added statewide. Right. Then on top of that, ne next week you have the counting of the provisionals. And you mentioned that. We, it looks like right now that the number of provisionals is going to be somewhere between eight and 9,000, mm -hmm. not as high as 10,000. And then you subtract from that the Democrats, which of course won't affect the governor's race. They'll be counted for the Democrat, Democrat race. Uh, that's roughly a third. So now you're talking maybe 6,000 or so. Uh, and then in any given year, uh, usually about two-thirds of the provisionals are counted and two-thirds are not to be counted under Kansas law. Our law lays out which ones to count and which ones not to count. Something so deficient to about the, maybe the four, uh, Something deficient about oh, the ballot. Uh, let me give you an example. If somebody sure. shows up on election day and they ha they've never registered before, they're given a provisional ballot, even though that ballot's not going to be counted. They're just allowed to register, fill out a registration card, right. and fill out a ballot. But that ballot's not to be counted. But if a person shows up um, and they've uh, they've changed address within the same county and they went to their old uh, uh, balloting place instead of the new one, um, they will their ballot will be counted except for the races that are not consistent between the two addresses. Mm -hmm. So some are to be counted, some aren't, and about two thirds should be counted. So, so I would say maybe four thousand, give or take. We don't know the exact number yet. Uh, will be counted, and that's I decided that, county by county. I assume that as Secretary of State, you've got some people very carefully watching all of this uh, transpire, particularly uh, the decision uh, about which votes uh, will be uh, permitted. Uh, that that process. Some have said that you should step aside as uh, uh, overseeing the uh, the process uh, as Secretary of State. Uh, I have to tell you straight up, I am delighted to see a re Republican official who doesn't instantly bow to a Democratic demand or a, <laughs> or, or another Republican demand in, in some cases and recuse himself. Uh, either you have integrity uh, and that is the test, or you don't. Yeah, it's interesting, Lou. The uh, my opponent who demanded recusal, he evidently doesn't understand the process. The the counting is actually done at the at the the county level, right. not at the state level. So my office doesn't actually do any counting of ballots, and so I said it's you know it it would be really pointless uh, to recuse myself since I don't actually get involved in the process. But I, I did say uh, publicly yesterday that if he if he really wants me to recuse myself symbolically. I, I would be happy to do so. So I may end up doing that anyway just to make him feel good. But it really won't change anything um, right. because we're talking about counties uh, counting the ballots and the so Secretary you, of State's office just receives the numbers. Well, I may have uh, made an unfortunate assumption because I assumed that as Secretary of State you would have people monitoring uh, those, uh, those central points that are gathering the ballots, uh, but you don't. No, we, we receive the data. So the 105 counties, they make their decisions on, on counting the provisionals, and right. they actually do the tallying, and then they just deliver the numbers to my office, and my staff receives those numbers and assembles them. So it's, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it, the Secretary of State's role is not that central or even directly uh, related so, at all to what's going on. So, so let me ask you. Who will prevail, and what is the likelihood, uh, given all, you've assessed it to about 4,000 uh, votes, uh, which way does that, uh, that break? You know, I, it's a really good question, Lou. Um, we'll have to see. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, fewer than 100 votes, or you know, give or take, uh, right now. So the election is really razor thin, and that's out of 300,000 votes cast. Uh, so it, it could go either way. And, um, you know, whatever the will of the voter is, voters are, that's, that's fine with me. Uh -huh. um, but I'm, I'm optimistic, and I'm looking forward to uh, going up after against the Democrat in November. Well, good luck, and uh, great to see you. Thanks for being here. Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kovac. Up next, the election fraud that President Trump has warned America about. 
is now a real threat. We'll take a look at how it could affect the midterms right after this break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, this is where we are and what we're looking for tomorrow. Judicial Watch moving ahead with a lawsuit against the Justice Department seeking communications between deep state actors, including Bruce Orr, his wife Nellie, and Christopher Steele, the author of the discredited dossier and former British spy. Tom Fitton, the president of Judicial Watch, uh, telling us earlier how it connects to the Mueller probe. I don't understand why this Mueller operation is allowed to continue uh, given that the, it's built on sand and, and it's yeah. corruption. I, I don't sand. think there's any I, I, question I, I, in the no minds doubt of the that's public. that's got to be stopped. Yeah. In Kansas, tomorrow we should have new uh, uh, totals that include mail-in ballots and the race for governor. Uh, that's the deadline. And then the count will begin in the subsequent week. Thousands of provisional ballots. Uh, Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach telling us about 4,000 votes remain, provisional votes uh, to be counted. Uh, he's optimistic, he says, but it could go either way. And voter fraud could well have an influence on the midterm elections, according to our guest Eric Eggers here tonight, a research director at the Government Accountability Institute, saying American elections are far from secure and the threat not, not from Russia solely at all. That's it for us tonight. We thank you for being with us. Uh, and when it comes to, well, the elections, don't you think everybody... Everybody should want security and integrity in our electoral system. We certainly do, and I know you do. Thanks for being with us tonight. See you tomorrow right here. Good night from New York.